Hey everybody, good morning. Um, I was at this event last night where we were talking about uh, some of America's most iconic and universal brands. I think the ones that were mentioned included Coca-Cola, Levi's, Apple, and Ford. And I was thinking about those brands and the concept of sort of universal appeal in a time like this, where uh, politics seems to keep intervening, and politics itself feels like this gravitational force of polarization. It keeps injecting itself into our lives, forcing us to take sides. And I wonder what it's like as, you know, as, a, as a company that's, that aims for universal appeal, like Nike, like JetBlue, uh, what it's like to feel like you've been drawn into a political debate that you didn't start. And I want to start with uh, you, Isima, and talk a little bit about uh, a tragic event uh, that, that JetBlue uh, had to deal with uh, just, I believe, was it one year ago? Yes, thank you. Nothing like a soft question to start <laughs> off. Um, I digress. Uh, so, I, you know, I think one of those examples for us was the Pulse shooting. Um, you know, it had nothing to do with our industry, but it happened in a city that we, um, one of our cities that we call home in Orlando. And so, uh, our CEO, from four o'clock in the morning, we had calls every two hours to figure out what we were going to do, how we were going to help. Um, and when people were busy taking stands about what happened and who did it and why and the demographic that might have been in the club, we were saying, you know, how are our crew members, are they safe? And crew members is our word for employees, so are they safe? Um, after we realized they were safe, did they have any family members there? And then, you know, quietly without fanfare, we knew that there would be people that needed to get to Orlando. Um, and how do we help that? And so we flew families down for a l very long period of time to t tend to their lo loved ones, to check on their loved ones, to, you know, unfortunately um, claim bodies. And, and we did that without fanfare, we did that without talking about it, but we did it for free. Um, we set up a command center. We called some of our partners and asked them to help. I think sometimes you just have to respond and hopefully rise above the noise and the chatter. Right. Vanessa, I asked you because Nike is, is one of the definitions of a global company, whether you had faced these sort of political challenges abroad. Yeah. And um, I think to answer that question, I have to first start with Nike's mission, right? So. Our mission is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And usually, if you see this written down, you'll see an asterisk by athlete, right? Because we believe that if you have a body, then you're an athlete. So all of you in here, you're with us, right? You're an athlete, you're an athlete, I'm an athlete. Um, and so that's really important. Uh, and it's, we have this really core belief also. Um, we're obsessed with unleashing human potential. And we really believe in the power of sport to unify. And I think those are principles that we hold on to regardless of what country we're working in, what time we're working in, um, we tend to focus on what's closest, as individuals, as human beings, we, like what's closest to us. But there's something happening around the world all the time. All the time. Every day. Like right now, I don't even want to think about what's happening around the world while we're on this stage. Um, and so one of the examples that we were talking a little bit about uh, earlier is our partnership with the city of Rio uh, that we announced during the Olympics. So uh, kids in Brazil are part of the least active in all of Latin America. Um, that's shocking. That, that is shocking. I just want to make sure that people heard that right. So peop Brazil is Brazil. the least active country in Latin America. Kids in Brazil are the least active in Latin America. And today's generation of kids are the least active ever in history, regardless of what country you're thinking about. Um, it's, it's, it's sadly one of those universal situations. So we're obsessed with human potential. Um, we don't, you know, we, that's not okay with us. Uh, and for the Olympics, we thought, well, what an awesome moment. You've got this global stage. It's one of those moments where people around the world are being inspired to try things, to see things, to do things that maybe you might not be thinking about on during other moments uh, and times around the year. But we start our work pretty early. You can't just go into a community and say, boom, this is one of what we'd love to bring and do with you. Uh, we go in and we, we, we develop insights. We speak with communities, we speak with the kids, we speak with their families, teachers, 
PE uh, teachers, coaches, um, thought leaders, policy makers, et cetera. We really, we talk to a lot of people. And based on that, we develop some insights and we go back and we say, we think we heard you say this. And in Rio, we go back and we said, we think we heard you say that these are the barriers for kids to get active. Um, can, you, can you just yeah. name one, name one of those barriers? Sure, so uh, if you've ever been to Rio, um, one of the things that we looked for was we start, you know, we focus on the athlete. In this case, there were kids. So where are the kids? Most of the kids uh, are, so the most densely populated areas in Rio uh, are, are, uh, are within these areas uh, called Olympic villages. They're kind of like safe havens. I, I want to call them rec centers, but there's so much more than that. They're a space for the, where the community can go, feel safe, secure, be active. Some of them have, uh, uh, do provide uh, wedding ceremonies once a year, that type, of, that type of a place. Uh, there's 22 of them. They're not related to the Olympics, the IOC itself, but they call themselves the Olympic Villages because of the diversity of, the, of opportunities that they offer. Um, and what we heard from them were, were kids don't, there's not, they don't feel safe and it's not secure. So if you ever go to, to one of these areas, even if the space were safe, they're not really designed for movement. You can't just go outside and play. What we heard from the girls were, you know, you don't, you're not offering a lot for me. Mm -hmm. We want to see beach volleyball. We want dance studios. What you're offering is not girl friendly. What we heard from some of the kids in general were that, hey, if I don't play football or soccer, um, then there's not really a lot for me. I'm not an athlete then. We're like, no, 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 you are. There's more, so much more. So they wanted diversity. They wanted to feel safe and secure. Uh, some of the design, um, and also, also coaching. I think probably everybody here can think back to that first time that you either had to put on a uniform for gym class, were chosen for a team, or not chosen for a team, or were told to do, for me it was pull-ups. I still shudder. Anything that looks like I might have to, might require a pull-up, I get it right now. I'm traumatized. Um, and that's true for a lot of kids. And so they associate negativity with physical activity. And one of the things that we're committed to doing is providing coach training so that they understand how to create inclusive, fun, positive experiences that are age appropriate for kids. I think that's interesting that you Go said um, we went into the area and asked questions. And I think in today's CSR world, that's how you have to build a program. Um, I think back in the day you built a program in the office and then took it out to the community. And now you have to go to the community, find out what the need is, talk to the people who you're going to be helping, have them be part of the solution, and then build a program. So um, we, we have to operate like that as well. So. well. I think you know sometimes the community talks back to you, sometimes it screams back to you. And yes. in the airline industry, uh, there's a lot of screaming that's mm -hmm. happening on social media. Uh, there are a lot of videos that came out. There seems to have been, there was a spate of them maybe six months ago, nine months ago, um, uh, with United and American. Um, I, I do wonder, because, you know, uh, and airplanes are a fantastic technology, but at the same time, you are packing a lot of people into a little tin can and flying them at 30,000 feet in the air, and it is really stressful. But well, we do it with free snacks. Sometimes with free snacks, of course. <laughs> and televisions in every seat, I'm just saying. <laughs> but how, so how do, you, how do you preemptively prepare a company for what seems to me to be the inevitability that you have some sort of social media moment that forces you to respond to it? I, I don't know if you can necessarily prepare people to the extent, because everybody has a phone, right? So somebody could post a very unflattering picture of me right now. <laughs> um, but I think that what you have to do is give your frontline crew members all the tools so that they can make good decisions. And I think for us, we are going to mess up. It's inevitable, right? Like you said, but how do you recover? And I think that's what we do so well. We care and we recover well. So, and then we have a great team monitoring social media. So I, I've seen some great conversations where somebody would 
send a tweet that I'm on my way, I'm going to be late, and the response was immediate. And, and they had an exchange all the way to the gate. Our social media team is great, um, and they're responsive, but I think if you give your crew members the tools, then hopefully you can mitigate some of those things that could happen that end up very ugly. Right. It's interesting. I, I'm, I, I write a lot about both the airline industry and the state of retail right now. And the state of retail right now is traumatic, uh, to borrow a word that you just used, I think, for a lot of legacy retailers. You have record bankruptcies uh, throughout the U.S. economy. You have all sorts of stores closing down, Sears, and JCPenney, Aeropostale. Um, it's become a really cutthroat environment because there is so much competition, both globally and from online startups. And I wonder, do you see that consumers are looking for some sort of patina of either, maybe it's um, uh, a, a, a brand doing well or a brand meaning more than just you know, selling apparel. Um, do you guys see your corporate social responsibility message as sort of providing that moat, that edge for you? Um, I think everybody expects it, right? So we talk about millennials and Gen Z, but I think everybody expects brands to stand for something. And, you know, we've, I've shared, we stand for inspiration and innovation um, and for every athlete. And for us, it's not just about the one transaction, it's about the relationship that we build with every single athlete around the world. Uh, in terms of retail, I think what's important for us in, in carrying that thread through uh, to the culture of our employees is that Oftentimes when people think about companies and, you know, we talk about the faceless company and I like to think that we're really faceful. We are, we have a lot of store athletes, what we call our store employees. And you can go into one of any one of our stores here in New York City, but you can go do that in China and Japan, anywhere. And I think what you'll find, you'll find a couple of things. One, they're from these communities. Uh, the, when we go out and do the community impact work, we're doing this with uh, schools or organizations, community centers, areas where they grew up and that they're from. They're personally uh, invested in it. I think you'll also find that when we say we're obsessed with human potential and we truly live and breathe sport, you'll find that with every one of our store athletes. Uh, just go out and talk to them. Uh, they are athletes, uh, they are out there, they are playing, they're coaching. It's actually really humbling to think about everything that they are able to find the time to do. But I think that's important because they're really at the forefront of that consumer contact every single day. And without that being something that's pervasive within the culture, you can't control it. Um, yeah, there are two sort of big picture shifts that are happening, I think, in CSR that, that I've noted both from this conversation and sort of thinking, it, thinking about it backstage. The first, I see, you sort of summed up very well, which is that rather than sort of come up with solutions in the corporate headquarters and then essentially have a unidirectional sort of export strategy, you sort of begin with a step that's a lot more like anthropology. You go out and you get to understand these communities, you understand what they're about, and then you bring back those lessons to maybe the headquarters and you figure out a corporate social responsibility message there. So sort of, you know, uh, a top down maybe oh, to yes. bottom up. Um, that's number one. Number two is that I've always thought of corporate social responsibility as being mostly external, being mostly about how does our company help the environment? How does it help local communities? But I feel like we're at a moment right now, particularly a post-Weinstein moment, particularly at a moment um, where liberal America has, is, uh, uh, has a very, I think, loud voice on, on social media, particularly on labor policy. Um, where corporate social responsibility maybe has to be more internal as well, about not how do we treat our communities, but also how do we treat our employees? How do we make sure that they are safe and well compensated and cared for? Have you seen that shift, and are there ways that you have responded to it? I, I'm happy to say that our company was founded on making sure that we took care of our crew members. So we initially started with the mantra of um, bringing humanity back to air travel. We think we've done that. <laughs> and so we've moved on to now maybe doing, um, so now we're talking about inspiring humanity. And that starts inside, charity starts at home. And so we try to take care of our crew members in all situations, but in 
situations, especially we're proud of, like in, in San Juan, um, in Puerto Rico, where we have almost 500 crew members, and how we responded to the hurricanes, and how we made sure our crew members were taken care of, and how they're pay protected um, until the airports get up and everybody's working. And, um, and that's our business partners, too. So we really do try to, to make sure that we provide the resources and the opportunities out from our, um, we just started a um, JetBlue Scholars, which is a, a program to allow people to go back and get their degree um, really at a rate that all of our crew members can afford. And so I think that really you have to dig deep and start at home before you say that you're doing good in the community because then you're, you, you don't have the buy-in from the team, right? So if you can't, if you're doing something great in somebody's community, but you haven't done anything at home, home doesn't want to help. Do you see, and, and, and Vanessa, I'll let you go in a second, do you see issues like sexual harassment fitting under the purview of corporate social responsibility, or do you think it, it is in a different bucket somehow? I think it's... Um, it might not sit solely under corporate social responsibility, but I think there's definitely some share of responsibilities to making sure that there's a voice in the room and talking about those issues that might be taboo or that people don't want to talk about, it, whether it's sexual harassment, whether it's diversity. I mean, I think all of those things um, have been so siloed, but in, if the company really wants to move forward, there has to be conversation, and there has to be shared responsibility, and there has to be ownership, but there also has to be some level of comfort that you can speak on an issue and help the company move it forward because you're being progressive enough. And if you're not progressive, you're still gonna be siloed and working on these things independently, and that won't work. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that, so for us, we can't talk about unleashing human potential and then not take that seriously internally. Uh, it's not a new thing for us. I think it's been part of our culture from the beginning. I will say, though, that we have um, a quote that we love to, we, we, we say a lot internally, uh, which is that there is no finish line. And I think that's an important principle to take into the space against all of those issues, right? It's not about... You can't just check the box and say, yes, we're doing great, and name whatever issue you want to fill in that blank with. It's an everyday thing, right? It's every time you are hiring or thinking about development or pay or yeah. any of those things. It's not a, you don't get to just say, we hit that mark. It's really, you know, um, there is no finish line. It's an everyday, continuous uh, improvement, and when you get there, what's the next standard? I have one more question before we turn it over uh, uh, to the audience, and that is um, the last 12 months, 18 months, um, have, had a lot, have seen a lot of turmoil and have forced a lot of companies who did not consider themselves necessarily political or necessarily controversial into politics or into social media controversies. And I'm interested with you guys looking at sort of the future of politics and also the future, frankly, of, of social media and the way that consumers interact with companies, um, whether there is a big picture trend that you see developing. What, is, what, what are you either afraid of or excited about as sort of the next click in this wheel that companies have to keep up with? I think for, for us, it's making sure that we are staying ahead of and uh, and paying attention to what's happening so that we can respond internally and externally, that we're not so steeped in, this is our program and this is what we do and this is the way we respond, that we can't shift. So um, whether it's childcare getting defunded, whatever it is, it will affect our crew members and it will affect our customers, but how do we respond? And I think we have to just um, stay ahead of those things, ahead of those treads, and bring, make sure those are the conversations in the room, right? Because your frontline crew members aren't there to say, you know, this program is no longer funded and we don't have childcare and I have to be at work at six o'clock in the morning. So how do you make sure that, that we are staying ahead and responsible to our crew members and our customers for things that are happening um, that they don't have any control of, and then how are we responding accordingly? And briefly before we go to questions. Yeah, I'm excited and optimistic about the future and I think what social media has created because it's brought in a lot of voices and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. 
um, and increasingly uh, diverse, multiple voices. And it's creating a dialogue and it's creating a space for conversations that need to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's where a, a good focus, not just for us, but I think for everybody is to keep that dialogue open um, and keep inviting those voices to come forward. Great, thank you. Questions, back here. Hi, I'm Maya, I work at Bloomberg. Um, my question is for Vanessa. You, um, Nike got a lot of attention this spring for uh, starting the Nike athletic hijab. And my question for you is beyond just having a CSR department, what is the responsibility from a consumer goods company to use their products to inspire inclusivity and uh, an understanding of different cultures uh, around us? Yeah, it's a great question. I think we come back to our focus on the athlete, right? The pro hijab came out of a, what are the barriers for some of our athletes to have a really positive experience with what, whatever sport they're in. And what we heard back is we need some help in this area. And we're really always listening for that. And we're, you know, it's, it's all about the, we're here to help you be the best athlete that you can be, regardless of where you are in that process of what that means to you. So that's our, our responsibility, uh, always goes back to the athlete and, my, and for me, and my community, the community impact space, for me, it's always about the kid. Right here. Hi, thank you, my name's Aaron. Um, my question is for both of you guys. I, you know, given the number of communities you, both your organizations play in, uh, and how vast that space is and the number of people that you touch, um, when you think about your responsibility to them, how do you figure out where to focus? and where to have the greatest impact and, and put some borders around what could otherwise be a gigantic, you know, unmanageable space to play in. Um, I think for us, we talk to our crew members and we find out what, what, it, what they're passionate about and then what's important in their communities. So for all the cities that we serve, our crew members have the opportunity to do volunteer work and we don't dictate that and that really helps us have an impact in the community in ways that we might not necessarily engage in. Um, and then we reward that. So for every 50 hours that our crew members volunteer, they get two positive space round trip tickets to donate to the charity of their choice. So then that allows them to pay it forward um, so they can volunteer here and then donate their tickets there. And we're a relatively small company, so 23,000 crew members and counting, but last year we logged over 175,000 volunteer hours. Our crew members are out in the community making a difference. Last question right here. Hi, thank you so much for this morning. Really appreciate it. I'm Karen. Um, I have a question for both of you, either of you. Um, I truly believe that when you're making a positive difference in society and you're impacting communities that it actually helps your brand and your business, back to the conversation with Kind earlier today, and then you can do more good. And so it's a virtuous cycle. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you believe the work that you do actually helps your business or your brand, and if, or if it's just the right thing to do in a belief system? I'd say it's, it's all of that. Um, so I think from a, you know, we've got a really sharp focus. It's not the only thing we do. We don't only focus on getting kids active, but it's a really sharp point for us, and we, 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 ha we drive major investment into, into that space uh, because we care about the future of sport. Um, and we we believe in human potential and I think we, a more active world, yes, is, is good for our brand. Um, it's good for our, frankly, all brands in, in the space and it's good for the health industry and so many others, but that is, you know, we, are, we have an eye um, on a future where the world is active because it's really, it, it would be really challenging and terrible if, if we had an inactive world on that piece. It's also really engaging for our employees because we talk about our 70,000 plus change makers. They care. They want to be at a place where, you know, they come to Nike because they love sport, they're passionate about the brand and they want to share that. And so for us to be, I think it, if we didn't have a way to channel that energy, right now we're in our give your best uh, season. And our Give Your Best uh, initiative means that no matter what you care about as a Nike employee, Nike supports you. So if you, go, you get volunteer hours to go out into your community, for every hour that you volunteer, you get $10 an hour that you can get, then give forward to any organ organization of your choice. 
because we're trying to fight the physical inactivity epidemic, if you give it to a, an organization that's trying to bring sport and the benefits of sport into the community, we'll double that. Um, so there is that purpose piece, um, and there's that piece about just being truly authentic to who we are, and, and that's, that's where we began. Um, and I think that's where we'll be for in the future as well. Great. Thank you, Isima. Thank you, Vanessa. And thank you all.